there was a time where he was showing his penis to people around at the office a lot. <laughs> is that is that frowned upon? Yeah. He was a police officer in New York for 20 years. <laughs> it's our theme music. I like it. Do you really? Hold on, give me a minute. Yeah, I do. Thank you. Yeah. This is Howie Mandel does stuff. I'm Howie Mandel. I'm Jacqueline Schultz. And the lovely Jimmy Kimmel is in the room. I oh. love you. I love you too. Thanks really for do. having me. No, thank Here, you. For this so is, I mean, this is a remarkable operation you have here. I, I think people like they see Howie Mandel and he's fooling around and he's he, judging people and doing silly things, and they don't realize that you're like, um, like an like a good version of Elon Musk. You've got this big technology <laughs> empire going on. It's incredible. That's how you see me as a good version of Elon <laughs> Musk. <laughs> You're incredible, buddy. When you talk about an empire and building something more, and I don't know that the average person, I think everybody in this business knows, but I don't know that the average person knows what is behind. I am fascinated by how much you do and for how long you've been doing it. And th that is Obviously, we see a show every night, which I think people don't understand how much work goes into that. You don't just show up for that hour. That is a life. Yeah. It's more than a life. It's so consuming. I did it for a year. I don't know how you're doing it each and every day. You have a, a very prolific production company and a lot of other things that we're seeing on the air you are behind. And not only behind in name, I think you are kind of hands-on and and direct it. I am, yeah. Pretty hands-on. <laughs> Perhaps too much, yes. Really? <laughs> yeah. And, and we'll talk about a, a lot of that stuff. And then you are um, just, um, you do really good work for the community. I know you did a lot. How's your son? Is your son good? Can He's you... doing great. I have two sons, actually. I have a 30 or 29-year-old son and a 5-year-old son, and they're both doing great. I met your I met your your older one at, at the show, and your 5-year-old is what I was asking about, the amount of work that you've done for Children's Hospital and the, the amount of work you do politically. And you just, every time I see you or hear about you, you're doing something. I, the, I asked you to come here. I saw you at an event, at a fundraiser you spoke at. I, I just talked to my friend yesterday. You were at a wedding in Florida last week. <laughs> I, I was. Don't, yeah. 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 <laughs> Whose wedding were you at? It was my friend, James Baby Doll Dixon's daughter. Oh, oh James Baby Doll Dixon. Yeah. I know who that is. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Baby wow. Doll's daughter was getting married. We went down to Florida. Actually, the weekend before, I was in Ohio at our former nanny's wedding in Cleveland. So we've had a lot of weddings lately. There's a lot going on. I had a parent-teacher conference this morning, even. Did Funny, you really? My For the daughter, 20 year old <laughs> My daughter is eight, and she's at the house. They had the day off because of the parent-teacher conference. Very relaxed, watching television, and I, I told my wife, I said, you know, if my both my parents went to a parent-teacher conference, which never happened, I would have been terrified. I would have been. This would have been the. This has been. The, I would have been so nervous all day long that they were going to find out what I was up to, you know. But we, she was very which casual, mean, which means you weren't a good kid or weren't a good student. And that's the weird thing. I was a very good student. I mean, like I don't think I got a B until I hit like the sixth grade. And um, I was pretty well behaved, but I also, you know, I would joke around and I always thought, oh man, if my mom finds out about this, I'm going to be in trouble. Little did I realize that's what she was doing in school also. But Did you get in trouble in school? I didn't get in trouble, but uh, I just always thought I was going to. I don't know. I didn't get in much trouble, no. Where, what were the kind of things that you did? Were they practical Disrupting jokes? the class with jokes, yeah. Really? Yeah. So you were the class clown. You're the consummate class clown. Uh, kind of, yeah, but not in a... Not in a not in a big way, more of a just comments. Just I'd say things. That was my thing. I that's where I really. And got you knew it. from that time that that's what you wanted to do, or that's what you're no. going to make. What did you think you wanted? I, to do? I wanted to be an artist. I like to draw, and that was my plan for my future. That's what I thought I would do. And you do that now. That's another thing you do, right? I do. You know, I do it just for myself, really. But um, you I, and Howard Stern go on painting. Howard paints. I draw. Yeah. Sometimes we'll sit in a room and. Don't we don't speak to each other. We'll just sit there and uh, I'll draw and he'll paint. Wait, is that real? Do you really? Yeah. Do you get together and just have like paint night where you silently paint and draw together? It's not like that because I live in L.A. He lives in New York. I, I imagine that might happen. <laughs> Otherwise. But you go stay at his house and do that. Right. When we're on vacation, we stay at his house. We'll so you bring your house. colored pencils? I, what, 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 I what do. <laughs> I bring a big like pack of pens and uh, paper and I'll just sit there and whatever I've been thinking about drawing for the last six months, I'll sit there and work on it. 
Wait, you think for six months before I you just, put a pen to paper, you will think I'm gonna kind of yeah you're not a doodler you're a planner i doodle as well but sometimes i think oh i want to draw this and i just don't have time but we it's the one time in my life other than sitting down with the kids and drawing and the most for the most part i have to draw what they want me to draw but it's the one time in my life where i will block out two hours just for artwork what's the next pro like what do you draw what do you, what are the the subjects of your I drawing think, um I was watching that making of a murderer. You remember that um, yeah, I'm trying documentary? To think what picture comes to mind? <laughs> and I just drew all the people on it. You know, that was uh, <laughs> they were interesting people. Yeah, they, they had were good faces. Yeah, they had really. So you, uh, what's his name? What's the main guy on the making of a murderer? OJ. There? No, different murderer. Um, no. <laughs> Have you drawn OJ? I forget the guy's name. Yeah. Um, Steve, Stephen Avery. Stephen Avery. Could I draw OJ? Sure. Yeah. Anybody that has an interesting face, I can draw. Wow. Yeah. Like if I give you a pen. Really easy to draw. So if I give you a pen and paper, can we continue this and you can draw me as this goes on? I cannot draw and Talk. converse at the same time, but um but I could yeah, I could draw. I, I will draw you if you we'll take a picture or a little video or something. Okay. I is need that, my reading glasses too. Is that like your form of meditation? I think so, yeah, probably. Yeah. Wow. But it just seems the the image of you and Howard Stern in a room <laughs> silently for hours sketching and painting is kind of, you, you know, that's a little, you know, I know, I know it's weird. <laughs> beyond weird. You know, it's beyond weird. It's also weird. probably among the more normal things that we do, but it's weird. Yeah. You guys are really legitimately close friends. Yeah. And, and is that the biggest bonding thing, the art? What else do you share in common? Oh, um, mostly just talking, mostly just bullshitting and talking about people and Talking about things, you know. Positively about people? I'm mostly not, no. <laughs> <laughs> you worked with Howard. Do you have anything negative to say yeah, about then him? What has he said about me? I think he loves Howie. Howie. I think that um, he does occasionally find you annoying. I don't think he's, this is anything that no. he, he wouldn't say. No, he said it over and over again. he hasn't said on the air. <laughs> no, he no. said it to my face. He said it on the air. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I only see him occasionally. So when he says he occasionally finds me annoying, <laughs> no. it's just every time I'm he sees me. I'm talking about when you guys were on AGT together. I think, uh, yeah, Howard's not one for like hijinks and pranks and that kind of stuff. No, and, and you and how very you, much are. Yes, I, and so are you. you. You know what? I met you the first <laughs> time I actually had the interaction. You've talked about it on your show many times. Is you and Sal were on a date, uh, like a, a live date of yeah. comedy with uh, me, and a, there was a bunch of other. I think Arsenio, Arsenio, was in. Tracy Morgan, yes, and us, yes. yes. And I fucked with you a little bit. It's not a great. No, prank. it was a great. It was really funny, and because I because the backstory is what really makes it funny. The Lakers were in the playoffs, and I wanted to watch the playoffs. And this was how I decided whether I was going to do this gig or not, because it was in Dallas. Right. And I'd have to go to Dallas for it. And I don't do stand-up comedy in general, you know, so it was a weird thing. I didn't have any material. I don't know what, that, what I was going to do. But um, Can we, before you talk about what I did, do you yeah. remember what you did that night? I do. I remember what. Oh, do you remember what I, oh, yes, I do remember. I, what I remember I did. looking out. Your pants are down around your ankles. And oh, you're yeah. on the phone with your ex-wife. Yes, yes. I was well, she was my wife at the time, and I called her and we had an argument about I think our car keys. <laughs> That's what I did. That's, Wait, is this on stage? On yeah, stage on, in yeah. front of like five, ten thousand people. Jimmy Kimmel standing there with his pants around his ankle. She is she was really angry on the phone. Yeah, yeah. And not just on the phone, yeah. <laughs> but he had her on speakerphone. So she was not thrilled with you. Before the phone call. Yeah, no, she was mad at me for about 15 years, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's funny. I I didn't even think about that, but yeah, that is what I did. But from my perspective, I don't know you, and I didn't know that you had a, like a stand-up act, right? And I was I, kind of I excited. Didn't. Yeah. I didn't have a stand-up act, and, but I did want to watch that Lakers game, and they promised me that I would have a room in which the Lakers game would be on. I was like, okay, we'll come. So we come and we and sure enough, we we have a room and there's a nice big television and I'm quite happy. We sit down, we start watching this game, and the channels keep changing. The oh. ch channel keeps changing, <laughs> and we can't find the remote. <laughs> we can't figure out what's going on. And your maniac father is in the next room. <laughs> 
with the remote control changing the channel. Can I tell you, I knew that you were going to say that because he used to take a universal remote to like bars and restaurants <laughs> and do the same thing. I go to a sports bar <laughs> and I, somebody built me or gave me this universal remote and I could go to a sports bar where, you know, the, where the Giants fans are like, and they'd be coming to the Super Bowl and I'd go sit in the back and I could aim it at every screen and put on ballroom dancing, and you just to hear the screams and the anger in the room. I is... love, you know, I have that same. I just, I love it. I don't know what it is about my personality, but it just makes me laugh so hard. And that's why I opened this uh, conversation with "I love you." You have made me laugh harder <laughs> than anybody has made me laugh, and that's my favorite stuff. You know, my favorite, and I've told you this before. My favorite movie of all time. I don't think I go two weeks <laughs> without mentioning it. Is Windy City Heat? Yeah, that was uh, that was my favorite. I think that was my favorite project ever. Also, ever. It's, yeah, it was. Uh, that was a lot of fun to do. For the make. few people listening that maybe don't know what it is, how did? How, first of all, how, I think that was a guy that was on your radio show. He was like, no, a, a nut, what? No, no, there's um, there are two of my friends, a guy named Don Barris and Tony Barbieri. Don Barris is my warm up guy. Tony's been a writer on our show and on the Man Show for twenty plus years. I met these guys through our mutual friend Daniel Kellison. Okay. He was friendly with Tony Barbieri. They came to a dinner at my house one night. This is years ago. I was a dish jockey. I was a uh, morning show. Kevin radio. and Bean? Yeah, with Kevin and Bean at K-Rock. And uh, they came to my house, and they they brought some cassette tapes. They'd been taping these calls with this comic named Perry Caravello. He's a comic? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> and that's where they met at the comedy store. They'd been taping these phone calls and playing all these crazy characters and pulling these ridiculous pranks on this guy. And I do remember my ex-wife at the time, we were listening to the tapes. I remember her looking at me and she goes, oh no. <laughs> she, knew. <laughs> she knew that this is the beginning of something for me. And so then I got involved in it and it's just crazy. It's like, it, it, it's, it, you, there are many, there are like a hundred people pranking one guy. I mean, that's really what this this is about and this guy perry we made a movie and we convinced him he was going to be a big action star uh, of a movie he played this character stone fury and the whole thing was just to just to goof on him oh you have no idea you just have to google windy city heat what's your favorite scene from windy city heat well um well i'll tell you it's interesting how that movie how how it got made in the first place i begged Comedy Central because they didn't understand what we were talking about. And I said, just give me $25,000 and I'll shoot the first scene. And so the first scene is Perry auditioning for this role. <laughs> and just one thing happens after another. It's just, it's just, we're just just annoying him. Throughout, and he screams and yells and he's a lunatic. And um, I played it for, we edited it and we played it for the head of Comedy Central. And I've never, still to this day, never seen anyone laugh harder than this guy, Bill Hillary, did. He was rolling on the ground laughing. I, he was dying laughing. Everything I see from that movie, I die. I, nothing makes me laugh over and over and over again more than that movie. And it's every scene of that movie. Okay. My favorite scene is the red bat, blue bat scene. Um, where oh, you know what? Pull it up. <laughs> red bat, blue bat, windy city heat. Perry is sitting in a chair and he's restrained. He's been tied up by the the two villains, <laughs> Big Lou and, <laughs> and this, these two characters played by Tony and Don. Well, he thinks he's in a, for those that, that don't know, he thinks he's in a movie. So the Perry character, uh, uh, it's hard if you're just listening to this, but the Perry character, he's an actor. He believes he got this movie and this is the red bat, blue bat scene. Yeah. Okay. In which Perry is, uh, okay, so then Bobcat Goldthwait is the director. He comes in, he goes, all right, Mole, and Mole is characters high all the time. He doesn't listen. He's, he's real, he's a goofball. He says, Mole, this is a red bat and a blue bat. The red bat is a real bat. Do not hit him with the real bat. No, the blue bat was the real bat. Sorry. The red <laughs> bat is the fake bat. This is the bat that won't hurt him. He's going to hit him in the head with the bat. The blue bat do not use the blue bat. <laughs> it's, great, it's this great moment of clarity where, of course, Mole picks up the wrong bat and is about to bash Perry in the head with it. Where Perry goes, why is the blue bat even there? <laughs> 
<laughs> it's actually a really good question. So when you sit there and you're writing, we'll, when we find it's it, there. we'll put it up. It's there, right there. there it is. No, no more stunt doubles when it comes to the rest of this movie. Because I'm looking at me as another Jackie Chan. I'm going to do all stunts. I want to explain this again. Red bat is the wooden bat. Don't hit Perry. Don't hit the money. So blue bat, rubber. Rubber bat, mole. What? Mole! 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 What? Mole. Dude, I got it! I got it! I'm doing this thing! What'd you Let's fucking do it? You got it? Red yeah, bat. I got it! I got it! Red bat, real blue. Yeah, bat. red bat, blue bat. Right. Here we come on! Not the red bat! Quiet! Let's rock this thing! Get rid of that red bat! Alright, he Get won't. rid of the red bat! Yeah, he knows! Let's go! He Let's go! Let's go! Alright, here we go! Guys, and 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 didn't even give me a room in here! Room, room! Battle out, baby! Oh, God, come on! Mole! Mole! Jesus fucking Christ! What? It's a fucking wooden bed, you asshole! How much preparation goes into, like, that scene? We're we gonna... sat down and, and, and hashed out the three of us, Tony, Don, and me, and uh, I remember just sitting there typing it all up. And we just imagined what Perry would do. And with one exception, he did every single thing we thought he was going to do. There was only one exception in the movie. Like, he reacted. We knew him so well at that point that he, it was almost as if it was scripted, even though it wasn't, because we knew what he was, how he was going to react. The one thing that was a little bit different, there was a scene, he had this beautiful co-star, and... um he was going to make love to her and they were going to be naked together. It was like a nude oh, scene. Stunt got... double. <laughs> in which case, in the previous scene, he had demanded a stunt double because we threw him into a dumpster full of like cow shit over and over again. <laughs> and they said, Perry, why don't you get a stunt double? He's like, I want a stunt double. And so then the next scene is the lovemaking scene. And just as Perry's about to make love, we bring in the stunt, stunt double. double. <laughs> now, we thought Perry was going to lose his mind and get really mad about this, but um, in reality, we didn't realize he was lactose intolerant, and we'd forced him to drink this big like shake that had milk in it, and he had to go to the bathroom so badly <laughs> that he didn't want to be in the love scene. <laughs> And there, I mean, it's uh, it's hard to explain, but all I can say, and the, the most important thing to know going into it, is that it is 100% real. Like, none of it is cooked. It is absolutely real. There's not one moment in that movie that um, that we faked to make the movie funnier. And why is, all it, real. Why is it underground? Like, why didn't it explode onto this? It was the lowest rated uh, movie Comedy Central had ever put on their network. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? It's the funniest thing I've it ever never, seen in my it life. It aired once and never again. Why? Because um, no one wanted to see Because people didn't know what it was. There were no um, known stars in it. It was hard to follow. There's no setup. You really need like... You really need some friend to tell you about it before you watch it. Do you think that people didn't believe that it was actually yes. real too? It is somewhat unbelievable, but it is real. And that's one of those things like hypnotism is real, but people don't think it's real. And no matter how much convincing you try to do, whatever. But I always say, like, if this wasn't real, if, if Perry was an actor... He would be the greatest actor you if you've ever seen because I mean it's <laughs> How you, know, you, you can't portray it that. Would be you can't pretend that more of an accomplishment if it wasn't real. And know? where is Perry today? Perry has his uh has a show on Twitch and uh people give him money to eat things and do things and um he's like it's like this project has like the fans have taken it over, you know. <laughs> but when he find when he found out when did he find out that this was not a movie? After uh, we put, the one thing he was suspicious about is that the whole thing took seven days to shoot. And he'd been an extra on many films. So uh, the idea that a movie took seven days did not make sense to him. And what we told him, we would just kind of play it as it goes. We told him, well, we ran out of money. And <laughs> now Comedy Central wants to pick it up and they want to make it into a prank show. And then Mole, one of the other guys, says, I want to be the star. I want to be the guy the pranks are on. And Perry chimed in and said, I will be the star. I will be the guy the pranks are on. <laughs> like, All right, Perry, you're the star. <laughs> that is so great. Yeah. I was uh, 
listening to you on another podcast, and I'm not going to rehash this, but you know, they were talking about how now, you know, because has ABC ever come to you and asked you, you oh, know, yeah, whether yeah. you want to lay off political humor a little bit because it is a broadcast network, and they, you know, and your answer was, and I, I, I love, I loved you for it. You said, "Listen, this is what I do. I'll go if that." Right, you just back. Yeah, you just back. Do you think about retiring? I mean, you are probably out of everybody that's on the air right now. You are there the longest. I know what it uh, personally. I don't know what twenty years of it takes, but I know what one year of it takes. Yeah, are you not tired? I, you know, I did. I was almost sure I was going to retire at the end of my contract in May. I was like, that. That's it. I'm. But <laughs> weirdly. I, I know this sounds dumb, but a big part of it for me is just the emotional baggage of wrapping something up and not just the emotional, like this, the, what you have to go through to like say goodbye to everyone, but also even just cleaning out my office is something that I <laughs> dread, you know? Really? Yeah. Like I have, I look around and go, oh my God, this is a nightmare. Like I, I'm not capable of throwing things away. So I have to figure out a place for all of this stuff and what am I going to do with it? And uh, that was a big part. And just all these things added up to, all right, I'll stay. <laughs> also, I like the people who work at ABC and they were, um, you know, they were really uh, enthusiastic, which I had not really had before. Like I was, you know, people, they always liked me there, but I'd never had, had them really uh, seem like, like we need, you know, I no, never had anybody say, we need you to be here. Wait, you didn't feel like that until now? Okay, people always say that I interrupt a lot on, <laughs> uh, on the podcast, uh -huh. but this is not even my fault. This is a commercial. So this is a, but it's an important interruption. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna wanna hear this because by listening for another 30 seconds, you will know how to get a reward valued up to two hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So a valuable interruption. Listen mm -hmm. to this. Okay, Masterworks. You're yeah. talking about Masterworks, yeah. right? Okay. Masterworks lets you invest in fine art, worth which is worth millions. This isn't NFTs. This is Picasso, Monet, and Banksy. Masterworks breaks these paintings into shares, so you can invest without needing millions. So why would so this you is why? It? So I didn't understand it. Now I'm starting to understand yeah. it. So the the value of the painting or the art is already there. So if you have mm -hmm. an an art piece that's worth ten million dollars, you always say I can't buy that because it's ten million dollars. What can I do? Mm -hmm. The fact that they're taking this ten million dollar piece of art, and there can be thousands of owners, you are investing in the art, and if it gets traded for a lot more, you're making the money. So you can invest like a billionaire. So especially now when inflation is high, right? It's right. one of the few things that you can actually go that can actually go up in value. And that's And I would think because of the economy right now, uh -huh. like the, the Mona Lisa is still priceless. So these paintings aren't being really adjusted by the economy. Mm -hmm. So I think it's probably a good investment. Yeah. Right. And you know, just a few weeks ago, Masterworks sold a painting for twenty one point five percent net return. I didn't know that, but now I've listened. Yeah. And now I know. Go <laughs> really <ahead>. good. <laughs> so you sign up with our special code at masterworks.art slash Howie. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you can save $200. Mm -hmm. It's a $200 value. And you couldn't invest like a billionaire. Billionaire. <laughs> I was trying to be classy. Yeah. That's masterworks.art slash Howie to learn how to get up to $200. Okay. Yeah. And you can see important Regulation A disclosures at masterworks.com slash CD. Now let's go back. To what? Our show. Oh. The podcast. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would After say 20 that. years? Yes. Do uh, you think that you were poking the bear a little bit to see if they would, no. you know, by doing political stuff and all, or saying whatever is on your mind and risking viewership do you think you're kind of poking them a little bit to see what they would do no and i really i'm this is just my i don't know this is uh, i really think that when they were trying to buy fox they were worried that trump was going to screw them up somehow and i think that was part of why they were nervous about uh my comments you know mm -hmm. uh, right. i don't think you know i don't think anybody was um certainly i don't think their political beliefs conflicted with mine but yeah if you want to do a you know if you want to have a big audience you want to keep every we don't want to piss a lot of people off and i was pissing a lot of people off 
But um, uh, as far as uh, being appreciated, feeling appreciated, I would say the first 10 to 12 years of my tenure at ABC, the feeling was you're lucky to be here. I think that's that's the feeling I always got is that somehow somebody was doing me a favor by allowing me to be on on their network and um and and that changed very late into my run there you know and uh, was there something that you think changed it well i think there were different people there i think that's what it was i think that um there's a group of executives that worked at fox who had a different uh, you know who who would who told me they would say like oh we, we wish he was here you know we wish we had him on our stage at the network up front or um you know speaking for us or you know whatever doing our show on this network and when they came over to abc they they took that opinion of me with them and um and expressed it which was you know which a lot of people don't do you know a lot of networks and to me i know it's weird but I, I worked in radio for a long time and i got fired from a lot of jobs and like my boss's opinion of me means something to me you know and maybe you know i know, I know that that's not the case for a lot of people i i don't think david letterman ever cared what his boss thought of him but that's somehow ingrained in me and um maybe it's from being fired so often uh, maybe it's just, uh, my personality or whatever, but that is something in me. And, um, and to hear, uh, the people I work for say that, uh, that they, they liked what I was doing and they valued me was important to me. That's kind of cool. But it's amazing to me and surprising that it's so late into the tenure. You know what I mean? Yeah. You work all these years. Listen, I'm in network TV now. You don't, you'd never feel most people don't feel as appreciated as you think you would like to be. So for you to feel that and it's well worth it i mean you do a great job so now you signed a contract for another five three three do you think this will yeah. be it i don't know i mean yes i do think this will be it for sure are but you looking at your desk and figuring out how i mean you're in a position <laughs> pack stuff. i'm hoping for a fire in my office <laughs> <laughs> that would solve everything <laughs> the other thing now and, and you have a beautiful family I, i've the other th when you go and do uh his show you are surrounded here i'm sitting here with my daughter and my son yeah. is a producer and my wife's in the other room but you are the consummate like family friend uh kind of uh, you've got this kind of family that uh, everybody works there all your friends work there cleto is a, a childhood friend right yeah my band leader we've been best friends since i was nine years old he lived across the street from me and his dad is in the band too you know i know his dad his dad used to work at caesar's palace i do when know I, that yeah. yeah 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 his dad's the greatest the greatest cleto senior yeah yeah his dad's really one of my like big comedy influences cleto's dad he's my 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 buddy cleto his dad was always funny and always pulling pranks he really is, oh yeah he is a big prankster i mean i'm surprised that he never did to me i'm surprised he didn't do that to you because he would do it i mean he'd do a lot of stuff he had a he has this very scary old man mask that he that is i mean in broad daylight it would scare the shit out of you but if you know he would just like appear you'd see him in the mirror you know that kind of thing is his head would come up there's just He's just silly. There's a spider, a fake spider, nailed above the door where many people would put a mezuzah. He's got a fake spider. <laughs> and I swear to God, it has scared me 700 times. Like, it, has gone, <laughs> it started, I was like, oh, it's, oh, that goddamn spider. But he's just got it. There. Where is that? It's a, It's at his house and on his door. And it's just like, it just scares you. When, and it just makes him laugh when you open the door and, and there's the spider the spider you know it's just it's something that kills him so you have your best friend your family works there right your my son works there my cousin mickey my cousin sal uh my brother is, is a director uh, sometimes on the show he'll come and do things a lot of it is because there's two re reasons for it one of them is i am at the show all the time and especially at the beginning when the show was live it was on from 9 to 10 p.m so I was there from when I woke up, I drive in and there till like 11 o'clock every night, sometimes midnight. So I, uh, if I ever was going to see anyone in my family or any of my friends, it was going to have to be at work. And secondly, I've always been of the opinion that if I think someone is funny, other people will think they're funny. And 
sometimes you have that opinion out of desperation. Like you're doing a radio show and you have to fill four and a half hours and you got some jerky friend and you pull them in and whatever. But I've always felt that if somebody's funny and like I agree with it and a few other people I know agree with it, it, you can extrapolate it and then America will agree with it. And I found it to be true. I mean, uh, like Adam Carolla is a guy who was my boxing instructor, you know, and I was like, this guy is super super funny he's like like i couldn't i I was really like taken aback by how funny he was and um and there have been a number of people like that you know some more famous than others but um people who come into my lives and i I, life and i'd say like oh we got it we've got to get you a show we have to do a show with you and somehow i convince people to make these shows or show i need to hire you as a writer or as a director or whatever the case but that can also be a a little bit of a a a landmine right because what happens if it doesn't once you bring somebody in have you had somebody really close to you i have yeah i've had to fire relatives i've had my uncle frank who was on the show who was a regular my aunt chippy is on the show yeah he i there are a number of times where i had to like threaten to fire him or he quit in anger and i had to get him back and i was like what a weird thing this is to have your uncle like you know the guy who like you know drove you to the airport or took you to the took you to see star wars you know you have to like scold him in a business way what you fired him you tried no, to fire- I, I i never Threaten. fired him but like there were times where he was you know yeah where i'd have to sit down and have a uh talk with him like you do with an employer like hey you know you 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 have to do this or you can't do this there was a time where he was showing his penis to people around at the <laughs> office a lot is that is that frowned upon yeah. at the Jimmy Kimmel Live it is now yeah <laughs> at the time it was it was funny because the first time he did it he got a big laugh you know he's in his 70s he's an old guy and so then he just like a child kept doing it i mean my son billy who's five does this too you know <laughs> and him just down? kept doing it and i'm finally like hey uncle frank you know it's like uh, uh, you, you can't do this is not we're not allowed to do this <laughs> Wait, but how did you find out he was doing it? I saw, I saw his penis. I mean, he was doing it like in the parking lot. He did it in like, you know, in the he did it at our writers meeting. He pulled down his pants. And then as he was walking down the stairs, <laughs> delighted with himself, we overheard him say these words. What a penis. <laughs> <laughs> So you, so you had to call him and have a serious, yeah, con- yeah. like, how do you say, Frank, uh, can I talk to you? Uh, just like that. I mean, it just seemed like a weird thing I would even have to tell him. He was a police officer in New York for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's an amazing story. That's a, I had something similar to that. You did? At, at work, yeah. Uh, on Deal or No Deal. Okay. And it was what? my son oh, who's yeah. in the room. My son is in the room. But how old was no. he then? No, he was he 16. No. What? Uh-huh. He said no. Don't say that. He doesn't want to tell that story. <laughs> Afterwards, you could tell the story. He didn't show his penis. Uh, okay. All I'll right. just say he didn't show his penis. <laughs> oh, he's got his penis out now. How about that? That's wow. not his He penis. did feel like a piece of meat. <laughs> what? He felt like a piece of like meat. Like a piece of yeah. meat. All right. <laughs> no, but it's not. It was. But. Uh, <laughs> <What you, laughs> he kind of threw me. Uh, speaking of what people did in the past, and now they're there. You're happily married. It, it, did you guys meet at work? We did. Yeah. You're not allowed to do that, right? Well, it turns out you are. It turns out. You are. <laughs> yeah. It's um because first of no all, one sat you down yet and told you that you're not allowed to. Yeah, I don't believe in that. I mean, I no, either a do lot I. Of people meet at work, and like you know, it's like it's one thing if you're you know if you're fucking around you know but you know, we we got married you know we we fell in love at work um she worked there for quite some time before there was any interest or spark and of course she uh, knew logically that it was a very bad idea but i mean i'm, I'm irresistible <laughs> 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 so she you made the move though um yes i made the move but yeah. as the boss yeah was that is that uncomfortable is that do you always feel like maybe they're reciprocating because they feel like it's part of the uh duty um i mean it wasn't it wasn't like i uh i called her into my office and said <laughs> hey it was very very gradual and it became apparent that the feelings were mutual but it, i couldn't even boil it down to a, like a moment or anything does like she that. still work there she does yeah 
Yeah. So yeah. is that what is that like to have your wife? I've been married for forty two years, and the beauty of uh, my marriage is that we don't work together. Yeah, and it's mostly around. great, actually. Um, we did have a big fight uh, yesterday, okay. um, <laughs> <laughs> in which she was yelling at me about something at work and how I, you know, like I'm, uh, you know, whatever. I'm, I, I, I need to uh, be more open to more ideas, et cetera, et cetera. And um, which was probably her idea, right? This happened. Yes. As a matter of fact, it was. <laughs> you got to be more. Right. And, and, and I got mad because I, I don't feel like it's off limits to be yelled at at home about something that happened at work. So she goes, all right, well, I'm going to yell at you at work about this tomorrow. <laughs> and sure you. enough, she came in the office and, and, and that very thing happened. Are you open to it? Al, uh, the idea? Yes. Yeah. I opened up. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I, but how do you do you not are you not tired i am tired a lot of times. i'm amazed that i you're have two even little here. kids that's what that's what takes it over the top it's not necessarily the work because there are a lot of things and i did because i thought i was going to retire i started a lot of projects that then came to were delayed and then came to fruition all at once because of covid um but the kids are the thing are the things that get you because they wake up early and you have to spend time real time with them and um so for me uh, we wake up in the morning and make them breakfast and get them ready and get them to school and then um at night i'll get home at like six o'clock and they're up until eight so uh you know we'll, we'll do whatever we'll draw or watch Sketch, tv or sit quietly dinner. in a room yeah yeah and uh, <laughs> there, there's never any sitting quietly that would be nice but um that's and then i will start with my homework for the next day so I, I have like another shift that starts at around 8.30 or whenever I can tiptoe out of my son's bedroom. And how long do you work at night? What, when do you, what are your hours like? I usually work till around 11.30 or midnight. And you're very hands-on, everything. Somebody was telling yes. me, like even the bits, when they call me, um, you've called me over the years to do a, a little thing or, or something, they go, we're going to run it by Jimmy and he's going to, but like you are, I go through every script. I the, every word, every word, everything. I don't know another way to do it. I wish I, I did, but I just don't. I just don't feel like the show would be. I, I wouldn't even say as good, but as particular to me because these shows are basically all the same. You know, so you stand up, you do a monologue, you go sit at your desk, and a band plays, and there's music at the end. But what makes them different is the hosts and. You know, I want the show to represent uh, my thoughts, my um, sense of humor, my personality and my, you know, opinions. So um, you can't really you can't necessarily get that from other people. So what I do is I take it all in in the morning. I get like 30 pages of material. I whittle it down to four pages of material. We have a rehearsal. Um, we have a couple of meetings and then we have another session where there are two writers, uh, Josh and Greg, these guys, they sit in my office with me. They write a rough draft, and then I go through and um, do a, uh, you know, a, a, sometimes I, a rewrite, sometimes uh, editing, sometimes just a little polish, but I always re, basically retype everything. Not only does it help me to tailor it to the way I speak and um, to how I want it to go, but also... It helps me to memorize it, you know. So um, when I go out there, aren't you? You're not on a teleprompter. I am, but I basically have it in my head, you know. So the teleprompter is there to remind me uh, of what I'm saying, but also um, if it were to suddenly go off, I could probably keep get going through it as long as I remembered uh, all the elements and in, in what order. But um, I can remember the jokes, you know. So can when you oh, go ahead. Can I ask you about one bit in particular yeah. that happens every single year that just passed? Yes, yes, yes. The candy. The kids with the candy with Halloween, where the premise is parents send in videos after Halloween where they say that they ate all their kids' candy and there's none left, right? And <laughs> then it's right. a montage of kids crying hysterically. Yes, yes, basically. Some you... <laughs> of them, so there are some sweet moments. And, <laughs> but yes. But do you ever get backlash because it's oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 about the kids that I mean, essentially you or their parents are making these kids devastated. Yeah. 
Would you ever do it to your kids? Oh, yeah. I've tried it on my kids. Of yeah. course I would. <laughs> um, Wouldn't you do it, Jackie? Honestly. Would I do it? Would you do it? Honest. Be honest. I think I did do it once. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think I did. Yeah. I think every parent knows or at least has a sense of whether their kid can handle it or not. I mean, yeah. I think if if the kid's, you know, if the kid's fragile, then, then don't do it. Um, is it cruel? Uh, yeah, there's a little bit of, of that. Um, is it funny? Yes, it's definitely funny. <laughs> do all of these kids when they grow up are, I mean, I've heard from many of them are like, they love having that, you know, yeah. and right. they love having that. And also, it's one of the funniest, as I've watch. said before, kids, uh, as you know, will cry between 17 and 500 times a day. So uh, <laughs> about every goddamn thing. So, the, you know, the, the, you can't like look at it in the context of the, of the way we do with adults. We're like, oh my god, you made this person cry. It's like, yeah, this person has cried before this bit, cried after this bit. It's, <laughs> there's a lot of crying that goes on. Yeah. Speaking of crying, you you are known for showing emotion, which is wonderful. I, I, I no, but it <laughs> I is. hate it. But yeah, I but, find it very embarrassing. Well, that's I, but I could I if I cried and. Everything that I've seen you cry about, you know, and they're always worthy of the tears. I don't think it's just maniacal. Yeah, just uh, <laughs> crying. Who are you to say what's worthy of tears? No, but what I'm saying is if something, well, I'm not, I don't he's think not that's saying a things discussion. are unworthy, but he's saying that these particular, right. whether it's somebody's loss, whether it's something that's happening in the family, whether something is going on in the world or whatever, and you are raw with emotion. Um, I was going to ask you, and you just answered it. I said, "Do you ever regret it?" I, I'm very, I'm much more closed. I don't regret it, but I do. Uh, like, I would never, like, I've never seen it, you know. And occasionally, I'll do an interview, and they'll like start running video, and I have to hide my eyes. I, I, I find it embarrassing. I, I, I do try to keep it together. I just can't. And my dad is the same way, you know. Like, I can't give a toast at a wedding without, you know having some tears you know and um it's just how i am i i and i've looked into ways like i've heard if you pinch your um uh this little weird spot in between your thumb and your forefinger that it will accept that doesn't work uh well i know. heard that one too That's i headache. once tried it but i started crying because it hurts so much if you <laughs> <Yeah>. pinch <laughs> so hard. uh and yeah so i uh i i don't um i don't want to cry in those situations but I uh, have learned, I, I now understand that in certain of, when I'm about to do them, that I probably will, so. And you just acquiesce, you just yeah, let it so go. Like, what are you going to do? I mean, you know, there's things you got to have to talk about, you know, I mean. Right, and you're always there on that platform, whether it was Kobe or a school shooting. Yeah, it's, or... like, it's like, hey, listen, you got to do a show tonight, and there's a big shooting in your hometown, and people were killed, and, uh, uh, you know, and. Look at you. We're in a commercial now, and look at Jackie. I'm looking good, right? But if you're just listening, I'm telling you she's looking good. You know why? Because you're wearing one of our sponsor's products. You are wearing Shady Rays, which has the essentials that you need to make summer complete. Shady Rays. I don't know why it has to make summer complete. It's not summer right now. I'm not wearing it in the summer. I'm wearing it in the winter. Yeah. I wear mine all year round. Yeah. Um, so uh, these are sunglasses mm -hmm. and they offer this Shady Rays will offer you really good. It's a combination of fit, style and performance without a huge price tag. Mm -hmm. So you're getting everything you want for a very affordable price. And it's not, well, I'm telling you, these are really good quality, but it's not just the quality that I like. Shady Rays offers the most insane protection program in all of eyewear. Every pair is backed by lost and broken replacements. And this one, by the way, I went online and my daughter picked these out for me. Well, and, and but the, the main thing is, because I always mm -hmm. do this with glasses, if mm -hmm. you lose or break your pair of glasses, mm -hmm. even on day one, mm -hmm. they will send you a brand new pair. Yeah. So wear it with confidence because, and this is another thing, Shady mm -hmm. Rays has your back along with your purchase, but they mm -hmm. also provide 10 meals to fight hunger in America with every order. So you're actually, not only are you looking good, you're doing good. They've, you know, they've donated over 20 million meals to date. They're doing good. 
Yeah. I like shady so ways. So look good in your shades. Feel good by making an impact. Yeah, exclusively for our listeners, Shady Rays is giving out their best deal of the season. You go to ShadyRays.com and use code Howie for 50% off two or more pairs of Polaroid sunglasses. Try it for yourself. The shades rated five stars by over 200,000 people. Can I just say one more thing before we finish this? Yeah. If you don't love it, if you don't love your new pair... Uh, there is a, a free exchange within 30 days. So you, there's a no risk to do this. Yeah. Shop at Shady Rays. And uh, and you could look as beautiful as me right now. We're in a, this is another commercial. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is a good one. This is our sponsor, Dave. I like the name. Yeah. And well, I like and what it's really doing. good because this time of year, especially, is always when I'm in a pinch for cash because it's the holidays and that's when I'm spending the most money on all those gifts. So this is when I need Dave the most. I'd rather you need Dave than need dad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I need Dave and dad. No, with Dave, you don't need dad. Okay. Okay. Dave is the banking app that can help you get up to $500 instantly with extra cash. That's more money to fill your tank, buy a wedding gift, catch up on bills, or spend it on holiday gifts, like I just said. Yeah. So that's it. So there's no interest and no credit check needed. That's mm-hmm. amazing. Millions of people have already downloaded the Dave app to get their financial relief that they need with extra cash. So if you're in a pinch and you need some extra help, you could download the Dave app and think of it as helping a uh, helping hand from future you. you future me or just future you, the listener or the uh, Dave. Whoever's downloading the yeah. Dave app, future so you. Download the Dave app from the App Store right now. That's Dave, D A V E. Sign up for an extra cash account and get up to five hundred dollars instantly. For uh, for terms and conditions, go to dave.com/legal. Instant transfer fees apply. Banking provided by Evolve. Member FDIC. Future you will thank you. That's the future you that downloads the app. Okay, back yeah. to the podcast. Uh, uh, it's just I just you know that's just how how much. No, but I, I actually think it's wonderful and kind of uh, you know I think that emotion is something that we shouldn't be ashamed of. But also you're also forced to share, you know. Yeah. And I don't know if that's I'm not a I'm trying to be more open and trying to share. I share my mental health issues and try to remove the stigma. But you do share. But you are also by virtue of being you're always your face is someplace every day. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the weird things about the show is that at the end of the day, every day I have to go on and talk and it doesn't matter what's going on in my life. And there have been weird. I mean, I, I, I remember times where like, you know, I was like going through a divorce and like I remember thinking about that stuff while I was talking, you know, like while you're doing the monologue. Weird. Yeah, it was like a weird disassociation. And uh, and I remember like uh, just thinking like, well, this can't be. I mean, first of all, it's not particularly professional if you're you're so uncommitted to what you're going to say that you're thinking about something else while your mouth is is you know is talking <laughs> is really a weird skill to have, you know. And um, I, I don't do that anymore. I think I'm more um, focused and and committed when I'm on the stage. But I had to learn that, you know, I didn't do stand up um, ever. I was a disc jockey, and it's as you know a very different animal, you know. Right. And um, I, the most experience I'd had on stage was with Adam on the man show. And because there were two of us, we had to have it pretty well scripted uh, other than like the Q and a portion, we had to have it scripted. So we weren't talking over each other. And so there were enough jokes to make it a monologue or a manologue as we cleverly called it. (laughs) And, uh, and so that was my doing the talk show was like, uh, it was like open mic night for me. So going, so having to work through these thoughts and things, what is the, has there been anything that you haven't talked about on your talk show that has been an embarrassing, weird moment that you had to work through that nobody knew? Like, has anybody ever shit themselves live <laughs> on the show, have the pissed themselves? Have, have somebody, like something weird that's happened? Uh, weird things happen. Um, mostly... They happen backstage. Um, yeah, we've had guests like, like full on hysterical crying um, before moments before coming on the show. Uh, you know, About we've what? had. Uh, 
Uh, well, mostly because they just weren't that solid, I think, mentally. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Have you ever one. had to cancel somebody, right? What, what, there was one? You want to tell me who that was? Yeah, I'm not going to tell you who it was because I don't think it's fair to this person. But I will say that this is a person my band leader, Cleto, knew very well because he worked with this person. And um, this person was hysterical crying for reasons unknown moments before the show started. Right. And I went to Cleto, um, my band leader, and I said, hey, uh, so-and-so wants to, want, would like to see you before the show wants to say hello, and did not give him any answer. <laughs> 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 and he walked into this mess. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And I said, You're, you know, Cleto, and Cleto really is like the guy who got me into pranks. We would, as kids, we'd make crank calls, and we're always pranking. And I just remember, like, we, and I'd, we'd, I'd sleep over his house all the time. And I'm asleep. We're sleeping in bed, and we're both in our underwear. It's the morning. He's on his phone, phone with his girlfriend, as he always was. And he's like, hey, Jim, will you go grab my... I forget what it was. He left something in the TV room. I go, are your grandparents here? And he's like, no, no, they're, they're not here, because I was in my underwear. And I run into the TV room, and of course, there are his grandparents <laughs> sitting there, staring at me in my underwear. And I go running back, and wow. he's dying laughing. He's just you know? like his Uncle oh, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. but he went in and did, did that person make it on the show? Um, that person did make it on the show and pulled it together and you'd never know that person had, <laughs> had been crying. And uh, that's weird because then you have to act like everything's normal. You know, you have to, it's like, hey, how you doing? And you go into whatever you were planning to talk about. But has anything happened like on the show when you're actually, when the cameras are rolling and then you just went, oh, we can't air this. So this oh, won't air. No, or, no, no, nothing. No. But there have been situations where like, somebody's nipple was out you know and like and sometimes i don't know if the camera's picking something up because i'm to the side of the guest so You're staring at the nipple. yeah and sometimes <laughs> and you know sometimes you can't help it you know it's it's distracting because <laughs> you know there's but a, you've learned to focus you there's just a six, nipple <laughs> out and you have to really like triple focus on not even on their eyes like i'll go uh, over their eyes <laughs> like to the like the forehead i'm i'm really focused on you know but um but you wouldn't stop like in the middle and go listen you're we've your almost nipple. never stopped not but i mean show. stop i mean stop your train of you know thought. what our um yeah our producers have stopped occasionally because like you can see up somebody's skirt or something like, hey, let me just quickly, you know, just out of like a cur courtesy, um, <laughs> let me just, uh, you need to straighten out whatever. And they're always very grateful, you know, and then we will pick it back up. But I say in the 20 years uh, of the show, we have stopped maybe a dozen times, uh, a you know, almost never. Uh, uh, we never redo anything. Never, never, never. Was there any guest that was banned from the show? Um, yeah, there have been guests that have been banned, usually not by me, but typically by like uh, the network will be like, hey, uh, you can't, you know, you can't have that person on anymore. And usually it's like it's profanity based, you know, huh. it's like if they want to like cursing a lot or um, yeah, that's usually what. We, we it's bumps, not like you with Johnny them. Carson, right? Where you brought no. out the tiger and then he no. never wanted you on again. He never wanted me. Is that right? Yeah. You got banned from Carson. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Those are Carson's front seats right there, the blue seats. How right many there. times had you been on? Twenty-two with, with Johnny. And then what? Again, I'm sure you've told this story before, but please, uh, uh, just for me, uh, the line. Why? I think there's a video of it. Did uh, we play it before? I don't know, but but the the uh, it was uh, when um, I'll show you the picture. Um, I think I've told this story before, yeah. but they, it was when, um, Sammy Davis Jr. Got, was supposed to be the lead guest and got diagnosed that they found out he had cancer and they needed a replacement. And Jim McCauley, who was the booker for the tonight show said, Howie, you got to come down. You're always, I said, I don't have a set. I don't have anything. Right. And I said, I can't go over. I can't. I have nothing to tell. Is that the picture? Yeah, it's the video. yeah, that's a video. Can you see the video? I can see it. It's running at high speed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they'll get to it. Oh, there's, yeah. you guys. Yeah, you, you watch the ads. You should guys should get uh, a YouTube account so you don't have to watch the mega deals and VRBO ads that are running right. And now, now. you just are, that's our new sponsor because Jimmy Kimmel just said them out loud. This is hot. but anyway. Uh, he said, show up. And I go, I, I got nothing. And I was working at Laird Studios in, in uh, Culver City. And I said, you know what? You just go with me. So I went into the their prop room and they had this 30-foot, uh, uh, you can see it right, saber-tooth tiger. Look. 
<laughs> but, uh, I found that. That's a saber-toothed tiger. Uh-huh. With a carrot, a giant carrot. I saw that too. Time. For 500 bucks, they said they were going to ship it. They were going <laughs> to ship it. <laughs> and then Johnny, look, now the audience has died down. Uh-huh. And I'm trying to get it up. Could you give me a hand with this? Yeah, you're trying had, to get on the stage. Yeah, it's I unwieldy. asked you to give me, but now I've blocked uh, Johnny, and at that time, I blocked, I can hear their headsets, the director's going, <laughs> I oh, didn't yeah. have a plan. Okay. Johnny's blocked by a huge carrot. <laughs> and a saber-toothed tiger. And a saber-toothed tiger. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> you can't see me, they're moving Hi. cameras. <laughs> and then, I'll tell you when to cut, but this is, this is what got me... So, how you been? I'm just fine, Howie. How? Oh, they cut. I've been they... great. What's... I've been great. Yeah. Oh, it's. I've been. I've been busy. I'm. Uh, you know, I'm a dad, and that's neat. Well, you're We're a just... new, new father, aren't you? I'm a new father. <laughs> With the uh, tiger. But I never <laughs> talked about it. And he said, "You could turn it off. You could turn it off." Finally, he went, "What is this?" And I went, "I don't want to talk about it." <laughs> I did something similar on your show. You were great with it. I wore a hairpiece once. Right, and I don't told talk not, about it. And I said, don't mention it. But your staff was so cool because they 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 said, is he going to wear that? Is there a bit? And yeah. I go, no, there's no bit. So they weren't sure whether I was doing a bit or whether I thought this hairpiece was like a new look for Oh, me. yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, how he's gone mad. I think you knew it was a bit and oh, didn't yeah, say anything, but they didn't. Uh. And what was funnier <laughs> backstage for me is they'd come in and they go, are you... Um, <clears throat> Are you ready to? Are, is everything ready? Is this how you're going on? I go. Is this jacket weird? You know, and it was just a hair. But I, I love that. You know what? what? My what? grandfather used to do that. He was bald. He was an old man, and he would wear this blonde woman's wig to like, like, like if my aunt um, took him to a coworker's wedding. But he would never. He would act as if he would let people think he was crazy, and they'd be like, you know, nobody would comment on it. And then he sometimes he'd talk about his naturally beautiful hair and he just loved the joke like he did he it, he was perfectly happy being the only one in on it you know what that's i swear to you that is so me my wife will go well who's the joke for yeah. and i always say for me because but they think you're insane i go I kind I of like, that. I love that more than the laugh. <laughs> a lot of comics say if I could just get the laugh. For me, when I do something on TikTok or I do something online, if they don't get it or they're angry at it or they think I'm serious, that is so much better. I can totally relate to that. And that's just how my grandfather was. Yeah, he was what very What a great much family. Like what do your parents do for a living? What did My uh, mom raised us and my dad was a, um, he worked for this company called Suma in Las Vegas. Um, it was a company owned by Howard Hughes. And Howard Hughes was uh, dead by the time my dad worked there, but they owned seven hotel casinos. My dad was like a low-level computer programmer, and he worked his way up. He became, uh, at the end of his career, he was a uh, senior vice president at American Express. He lived in um, in uh, in Phoenix. And, um, and you know, he, he was, my dad dropped out of high school. He was like a bowling hustler. He went and got his GED and then went and got his, his Wait, degree. he was a bowling hustler? Yeah, he would like hustle guys that for you know, my parents met in a bowling alley. You know? <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my dad's the only person in his family who went to college. He you But know. just somebody who meets a woman at a bowling alley. Yeah, well he you know, <laughs> it's it was Brooklyn in the you know, in the in the sixties. So uh they met at a bowling alley. And I did meet them one time uh, backstage at your show. They're so proud, right? They're just so, they love what yes, you do. Yes, they're very supportive uh, parents always. I mean, they were a little, when I decided I was going to drop out of college and then take a, a morning radio job in Seattle, they were concerned. And my dad was, my dad even offered me, and if you know my dad, this is a, a wild offer. He offered me $200 a week to stay and continue going to college. He wanted me to graduate. $200 a week. Two hundred dollars a week. Yeah. Did you negotiate? Did you <laughs> no, try to? I, just, I was like, I don't. I'm, I was like, listen, I'm go, I'm going. I, I, you know, I have no interest in college. I want to be on the radio, and I went. You're one of three siblings. One of three. Yeah. Yeah. You have a sister and a brother. Your brother is a writer director. Yep. Yeah. And your what does your sister do? My sister's a stand up comic. She's a comic. She's on a cruise ship in Tahiti right now. Really? Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. I, does she go by Kimmel? Yeah, Jill Kimmel. Jill Kimmel. She's been doing it for about 13 years. And um, um, when she started, I was like, oh, this is going to, this is not going to last. And uh, no, she's been, she's kept at it. She really loves it and she's good at it. Have you had her on the show? 
Um, she's been on the show doing bits. She's not done stand up on the show. We don't do a ton of stand up on the show, but she does do. She's a regular at my comedy club in Las Vegas, which uh, just reopened after we'd been closed for like two years because of COVID. So um, she does. She has a night there every week. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So Jill Kimmel, I'll look for that. And yep. is, is your brother working on your show? I know he's he's done. He's got a lot episodes. of stuff. He's got his own stuff. He's he's um he is an executive producer. He was executive producer. He's executive producer of Crank Anchors and um um he does a bunch. He does this game show. He's the EP of uh, called Generation Gap that Kelly Ripa. Kelly hosts. Ripa, yeah. And um yeah, he does a. You uh, produce that though, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you the oldest? I am. Oh, so that but that's good. Yeah. Right. And there's I think there's less. Uh, do you find you were competitive at all? Um, not really. I think, you know, I'm nine years older than my brother. I'm three years older than my sister. And, you know, I got into this at a very young age. You know, um, my brother obviously was influenced by, you know, the, right. the fun of it. And, they followed uh, you and uh, and follow me into it. And then my sister much later got in, into it. But um, uh, it's my brother's birthday today, as a matter of fact. And uh, where'd you get him? I got him a Weber barbecue grill. That's like the end of a bad 70s game show. Weber, <laughs> Weber grills are good, though. They're good oh, I'm not grills. knocking it. I mean, yeah. I want them as a sponsor, but I'm just saying it sounds like, and you'll go home with a Weber. I know you're into That's the right. grilling. I've been to your no, house. You have that pizza oven. Gift. Is that a good one? That you know is what a I, good gift. I did. I built a set, and I made him choose between uh, three doors, and uh, he picked door number three. And, <laughs> and I wish him a happy grilling. birthday. Yeah. Um, when you watch the other hosts, yeah, you took off the summer, and you, you allowed yeah. other people. To, do you watch that competitively? How no. do you feel about that? Did no. you love it? Did you love it? Like it. I feel very grateful when I watch it. I and it's weird. It's strange to watch it. I became less weird uh, over the course because we've done it for three years. But um, it's uh, I'm really like I, I get nervous because I want them all to have a good experience, you know, because they're doing me a favor and um, and I want them to leave happy. And the best way for them to leave happy is if they got laughs and if it went well and and uh, they were treated well. And um, it usually goes goes well you're truly a a, a good uh, kind of uh developed human being you know evolved human being you're really uh, i guess i don't think you have to be that evolved to i mean i think you have to be pretty insecure to fear someone else to, i mean you're probably probably not that good at it if you think anyone else can walk in off the street and take your job <laughs> You know? No, but I'm just saying it's a hard thing to, i bet you if you talk to howard about it he asks probably those same questions how do you or yeah, no, I That's think people his... do ask that because I think it's like um, it's a strange thing. Like you don't I mean, Johnny obviously had it. And then um, Dave only did it when he had a heart attack, you know, or not heart attack, but a heart surgery. And um, those typically are the only times where you'll, where you'll see that happen. But for me, I was just like, if I'm going to keep doing this job because it is all consuming, uh, I need to have the summer off. And um, I think if I have that, I can keep going i can suck it up and do the show for the other 10 months of the year and um it's worked out great for me it's a great break i, I love it is there anything you want to promote you don't have to promote anything but no. the jimmy kimmel live your well, uh, what are you, you well that new thing on abc we do we have a show called the prank panel which is gonna it looks amazing i just saw the promo for it yeah so uh, talk about that for a second it's a fun show and i i was thinking of you immediately when um this show is like it's like shark tank in that people will pitch a prank to this panel of uh, experts, which in Johnny Knoxville, Eric Andre, Gabourey Sidibe. And so they'll hear the prank. They'll decide if it has merit, if it's doable. And then if they like it, they will take it on and help them make it happen. Because I found that, and I don't know if you feel this way, one of the best things, if not the best thing about having a show is that, you can waste a lot of money doing stupid stuff, you know? <laughs> and and most people don't have that. And, like, you know, like, I painted my Aunt Chippy's house I green and orange. I love and that. And, like, it was, it was really something that I want, I thought of when I was a, a young kid. I thought, I would love, boy, if I ever have enough money. I never put it in show business uh, context, but I was like, if I ever had enough money, I'd love to paint Aunt Chippy's house a crazy color, you know? <laughs> And uh, you gotta and, see it. She yeah, gets so fucking pissed. And um, so now other people can do that. And I, it's you know, it's it's actually been going great. You know, when you pitch a show, 
you know, you don't really know for sure it's going to work. I mean, you tell the executives it's going to be great, but you don't know that it's going to be great because it has to be, you know, it has to be a high level, high reward. It has to come out really good. And it's, it's going really well so far. Well, um, I can't wait to see that show. I love everything you do. I watch you every night. I um, don't miss you. And you really, as I told you, with Windy City Heat and things that you've been involved with from the first time I met you, you make me laugh harder than anybody. You have a great heart. You're a great family guy. I got to, uh, you, were, you spoke wonderfully at uh, Saget's uh, Scleroderma. Oh, you were so funny at that thing. I, <laughs> it was I like, could see, I could see the wheel, the wheels turning, and I was like, uh, and I went as we had a little conversation in the lobby about something, and uh, you hinted at what you were going to jump on, and I went back to the table like, wait till how he gets on, <laughs> because it was, it was a, the very same thing. My wife and I were whispering to each other, which was amazing to me because nobody, nobody jumped on that, nobody <laughs> laughed at because the, it was, I don't know. That's just say it was what, very it was, ballsy. It, it was. was I know. Ballsy. I was so scared that I was going to get thrown out. But uh, yeah, Bob, <laughs> uh, his sister, he lost his sister to scleroderma, which is a very devastating uh, disorder, and uh, I think your organs become like oh, petrified and horrible, horrible. Horrible and you, you could see it in their skin and and whatever and people die from it and they had this really nice event it's what you, your father imagines is going to happen if someone shakes his hand you know yeah. that it's that bad <laughs> that bad <laughs> <laughs> and some uh, uh, chef that was giving away the auction they were going to do a dinner for 10 live at the at somebody's house <laughs> gets up and then just grabs the mic and just says listen i don't know anybody who has had scleroderma i don't i haven't had that uh that experience, and I obviously nobody in my family has had scleroderma, but I can honestly say that as a child I had eczema, so I know. <laughs> I no, know. you're laughing as if that was a joke, but, but she was dead serious. But this is what got me: the room. I heard her say it, and then I was listening, and I didn't hear a laugh. <laughs> nobody laughed. I thought she was joking, and then I looked out in the curtain to your table, Jimmy's. Like people are just looking, and they're going, and I went, really. <laughs> Really? Are you kidding me? And she wasn't trying to be funny. And then Did I, you talk to her afterwards? No, no. I didn't know her. I talked to you. I came to you. Because I was not sure I heard it. I go, I want to like bring that up, but is, is it just me that finds it ridiculously funny? That Eczema it, could be bad. You're right. I didn't even think of that. <laughs> you're right. You can't be and then that was the first really 15 bad. minutes of my act was about this poor woman suffering the perils of eczema. I know this woman comes to donate a dinner to charity. <laughs> yeah, she didn't say the right thing. I think maybe that next year she'll she'll it'll be clearer. She's not gonna. I hope she doesn't own a restaurant that I end up eating at. Yeah. She's not gonna be. You're gonna anyway, be eating spit. You're the best, yeah. Jimmy. Uh, listen, well, I'm fun. finished. If you uh, if you want to stay for another a couple minutes and just sit quietly oh, you do you have just... any other guests coming in we could interview them <laughs> no i have nothing you guys All should right. sit and draw together yeah we'll sit Spend quietly the last I like three minutes sitting and drawing together <laughs> but draw a picture of me yeah i will i will I'll i gotta get up. my glasses though because i'm blind i'm old and i'm blind are you blind i like you, you know you I, bad... re I can't read or oh, just reading yeah yeah just yeah, reading. i can't definitely can't draw without glasses on but do you have a prescription, or are you a number three or two, like a CVS kind of? <laughs> well, I had the LASIK surgery, and I have those. Yeah, no, I actually buy my reading glasses at glasses at Costco in bulk because I just scatter them all over in the house. In bulk, in bulk, because I don't want to run downstairs and get the glasses. So I'll buy them. They're like thirteen dollars a piece, and then um, I got I have like eleven of them in my house. Wow. So, you know, hey, listen, we, <laughs> wow. I'm rich. What am I going to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All what right, am I gonna hide it? You're the best. <laughs> Jimmy Kimmel live every night. This has been Howie Mandel Does Stuff. Can you play the theme music to close it? Thanks. <laughs> that was good. You're great. Thanks, buddy. Thanks. Thanks. I really appreciate it. You know, it's funny because, uh, you know, I'll do a podcast every once in a while. And, and, you know, only for people I, I like. And that's.